Hello and welcome to Open International News Talk Show. Now this talk show is a youth space and forum where young people get to share their challenges, hopes, aspirations and dreams. Now today we're going to be meeting two beautiful ladies from Zimbabwe who have broken records in academia. The first lady we're going to meet is called Musawen Kosi Saurombe who is the first youngest PhD holder and she's only 23 years of age. And we're going to meet later on Mao Chifamba who is the youngest person to ever in enter into university at 14 years of age. Welcome Dr. Mosawe Kosi. Thank you very much. It's How are you? Here. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Man? I'm fine. <laughs> I know that you flew all the way from South Africa. Yes. Oh, it. Wow. Now, I know you're coming from a long way and I'm sure you're quite exhausted, jet lagged. <laughs> well, it was a very short flight, so <laughs> okay, okay. not too jet lagged. Please introduce yourself again. Okay, so my name is Dr. Musawe Kosi. Yes. recently got the accolade of uh, the youngest female PhD graduate in Africa yes. at 23 years of age mm -hmm. and yes I'm an aspiring academic okay. just at the beginning of my academic career and I'm really excited to see what the future holds. We're also excited for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so was there ever a point where you felt like you were different when you were younger from you know other kids around you? Well, not necessarily. However, I believe each of us has an element of uniqueness. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. something that distinguishes or differentiates you from mm -hmm. everyone else. Mm -hmm. So besides that, I don't think I necessarily felt like an outlier okay. that much. Yeah. However, I I had, you know, a bit of challenges, especially because I didn't grow up in my native yes, country. So yes, obviously yes. that that was a really big aspect that came into play. Okay. You know, when you develop an awareness that you are kind of different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was something that I had to overcome and okay. deal with, you know. Okay. Did, was there a point where you felt like my brain probably programs things faster than if anyone else around me well i suppose so because <laughs> my dad my, my dad he, he he did detect that you know in me okay. from an early age he being a teacher by profession of course okay the ability or the dexterity to detect such mm -hmm. strength in a child okay so he he, he realized it from a very early age because i'm also a a musician. Ah, <laughs> interesting. As a so my dad told me, well, my parents, they told me that I actually started singing before I could speak. Wow. So my dad, he, he used to sing in a, in a group, okay. in a singing group at church, mm -hmm. and they used to practice at home. Okay. And so before I could even talk, or mm -hmm. I, was, I was still mumbling sounds, okay. you know, before I could actually put the words together, I used to mumble, and when they would practice, he'd find that when they would leave, I'll be humming the songs that oh, they were wow. singing. So I guess he was able to, to grasp that, you know, I had a very sharp mind. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so you being at 23, the youngest PhD holder, how did your journey begin when you then decided, I'm going to go to university at the age of 16? Well, that was actually a struggle okay. because, of course, um, my, my parents were not really ready to let go yes and so they, they they tried to keep me in high school for the longest time possible okay and i i had actually initially agreed mm -hmm. to do two years of a levels however okay. i ended up only doing one mm -hmm. i only did advanced subsidiary because i i just withdrew from the initial agreement mm -hmm. and i didn't go to the second year of a level because i felt like i really needed to go you know being somebody who's always needed a challenge in life i felt like high school was stifling my progress I see. <laughs> okay so what have you always aspired to become eventually back then i used to aspire to be a medical doctor okay yes that actually is reflected in my choice of subjects okay. in high school mm -hmm. i took sciences i had biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, you know, everything necessary to get into the line of medicine. Yes. However, after I completed my high school, I realized that wasn't my calling. Ah, right. <laughs> Fortunately,
unfortunately I realized early enough because a lot of people end up dropping out of yes. university mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. didn't discover soon enough. Yes. Okay. And were there challenges along the way in terms of academics or did you just sail through? Of course. <laughs> of I mean, because people would probably think you know, a PhD holder 23 things would just be easy. Well, there were a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to mention financial challenges, yes. which a lot of young African black people go through, Yes, you know, that's a very rampant phenomenon mm-hmm. in our societies. Um, I did have financial challenges because okay. obviously my parents were sponsoring my tertiary yes. studies and I also had challenges with the age factor catching up with me yes. in university. Mm-hmm. So it, it really took a lot of adaptation. Mm-hmm to come to a point of complete peace within myself and self-mastery. I had to discover my strengths and I just had to completely understand what I am about and where I want to see myself, determined by the purpose I believe God has sent out me. Okay. All right. So how has it been like for you socially, being able to interact with others? Because I know at... At 16, you know, in Zimbabwe, we're writing our all levels and we're thinking of our leavers dance and all that. How was it like for you? Well, the good thing is that um, throughout my school day, actually, most people didn't realize that I was much younger than them until, okay. for instance, at the end of high school, that's when a lot of people came to realize that I was significantly younger than them. Okay. Even in university, the friends that I made like most of them just thought I was their age group so okay. so at least in terms of that there, there were a few of course who knew mm-hmm. you know that I was significantly younger however it was not that difficult to fit in because they didn't treat me as you know the younger one okay yes so at least that wasn't too bad and did you feel the need at some point to brag about you being the youngest not at all because mm-hmm. Initially, I didn't plan on being here <laughs> today. Uh-huh. Yes. yes, I had other intentions. I had other plans. I wanted to go work, chase the dollars. <laughs> after your degree, hustle, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah. After your first degree, you just want to go make money. And mm-hmm. yeah, God has another plan. Okay. Well, after the short break, we're going to be continuing with Musa as she's going to tell us how. Through her experience, she's also been able to reach out to other young women in the community. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to the show. Now just before the break, we were with, and we're still with Musa Wenkosi as she is the youngest African to have or to hold a PhD as she's Dr. Musa at 23 years of age. Welcome back, Musa. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I know that uh, you're a postdoctoral fellow at the university, at a university in South Africa. Yes, um, that has always been your passion. Well, like I said before, mm-hmm. I hadn't anticipated or, you know, seen myself being here today. Okay. However, I feel that it was specifically planned, you know, okay. predestined mm-hmm. by God because I grew to love what I do. Okay. You know, and that is actually what pushed me to study further because as I continued, you know, with my postgraduate studies, mm-hmm. after my honors degree, I realized that I loved research so much. Right. And postdoctoral research, yes. though, is all about research. Yes. Of course, you have a teaching component, however, it's not as, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. as much as the research that okay. it entails. Okay. So, I feel that it was, it was just something that spirited. Right. And I know you're, you did um, industrial psychology. Yes. So that's something that you, you had always wanted to do too. Well, that's also an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because, in, like I said, before I went to university, I thought that I wanted to be a medical yes. doctor. Yes. And so I did everything medicine, mm-hmm. only to realize no, that wasn't my passion. Okay. So I deviated from that. 
and as I deviated, I couldn't put my mind, you mm -hmm. know, or set my mind on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So that's where parents come in. Yes. My, my mom and my dad, they, they were like, okay, if you want to do commercial courses, let's look at something that will be marketable. Mm -hmm. So my first option was accounting, actually. Okay. <laughs> and then my second option was economics. Okay. And then they said, you know, I just put down the third one in case. Okay. So fortunately, we had done a, a personality test you okay. know, at our career exhibition mm -hmm. uh, session at high school, like mm -hmm. for the final years, like the form fives. Okay. And so at that career exhibition, I learned that I'm a people's person. I love right. working with people. So that would be your human resource management, yes. industrial psychology. Yes. I love psychoanalyzing people. You do? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I psychoanalyze everyone I okay. meet. Too. Yes, so I ended up putting that down as my third option because I was like, oh, well, you know, yeah. the personality test is probably accurate. So when I put that as my third option, mm -hmm. to cut the long story short, mm -hmm. my application actually got lost. It went to the institutional campus instead of the campus where I was applying. Uh -huh. And so when they finally found it, the first two options were already full. So they had right. to put me my third option because that was the only one available. So it was kind of just So like I said, yes. yeah, it was predestined. <laughs> okay, so if you could be an animal for one day, mm -hmm. what would that be and why? I believe unquestionably I would choose the ego. Really? I love the concept <laughs> of the ego. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. Well, it's just such a majestic creature. Mm -hmm. And the ego really, you know, relates. I relate very well with the ego because it is very picky, okay. selective. Yes. When it comes to the associations mm -hmm. that it keeps. Okay. You know, you'll never see an ego in the company of a chicken. Yes, true. You know, they are really majestic creatures that take hold themselves in high regard, mm -hmm. if I should put it that way. And so that would be my favorite creature. And just the the way that it rejuvenates itself. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing thing is it has to first go through a crucible, a process of yes. refinement yes. before it gets to that rebirth. Mm -hmm. And that is something very important to us, especially young people yes. living in today's fast world. Yeah. We need to be able to rejuvenate and replenish. Yes. And so the ego just to me is like the most amazing creature. <laughs> That's very inspiring. And I know you've been reaching out to different communities um, and empowering other women. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, of course, you know, before I pursued this accolade, actually, um, it had just been something that I set for myself as a milestone. Okay. However, upon the accomplishment thereof, I realized that so many young people, especially young women, yes. you know, African like me, kind of were so inspired, more than I even imagined. And then mm -hmm. I, I just realized that this is actually bigger than me. Yes. And that it's important for me to give back mm -hmm. also and share the story that, you know, culminated to this present success. Okay. Okay. And so it's it's just really important for me to share this with other young people because I've also been at a point of giving up. Mm -hmm. I've experienced so many challenges that other young people are facing. Mm -hmm. Some people, they give up because of financial challenges. Yes. And I did reiterate, I, I will reiterate that right now, as I said before, that, you know, it's not always easy coming yes. from a, an African home. That is true. Financially. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I went through and it didn't stop me. You know, if I tell you I registered for my PhD with no money, you know, wow. and I ended up getting funding more than mm -hmm. the cost of my studies mm -hmm. because I didn't give up. I, if I had to knock on every door, I, I would, you know, so it's just... It's so just it was determination, hard work? Because <laughs> when people see, you know, a PhD student at Trinity, they just think you had it easy. Exactly. And I think that's something that young people need to constantly 
put in their heads. You need to work hard exactly. for everything. That is true. So I know um, before you were telling me that in a few months' time you're going to Rome, you're going to Las Vegas, you're going, <laughs> you're just traveling. Yes. What are your future plans? Well, of course, I'm now working on publications, okay. I'm publishing as an academic, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to travel is like amazing. The yes. sightseeing yes, is, it is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Last year, I was in Arizona, oh. in Tucson. Fancy. <laughs> it was really nice, although it was very hot, but yeah. it was really nice because it was something academic because I got mm -hmm. I was selected as one of the delegates to go there okay. because I'm part of the Golden Key International Honor Society. All right. They select the top fifteen percent mm -hmm. um perf academic performers. Okay. You know, and this is an American founded society okay. that found its way to South Africa. Nice. You know, so it's also in Australia, New Zealand mm -hmm. and other countries. So okay. they select the top 15 percent. So it was just really amazing being with other people across yeah. the world. Yeah. You know, people. It opens your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it breaks those boundaries and the barriers, and you get to think outside the box. You realize that you thought you were doing great mm -hmm. stuff, but there are people out there <laughs> <laughs> doing yes. great things. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Musa, for coming through, and I wish you all the best in all your endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Now, after the break, we're going to be meeting the youngest lady, or the youngest African to actually get into university, Maud Chifamba, at only 14 years of age. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Now, just before the break, we were with Musawen Kosi Saurombe, the youngest PhD holder in Africa, and she's only 23 years of age. And she was telling us a little bit about her experience as she went through the whole process and also how she has been also able to reach out to other young women within the community. Now, right now, we have the youngest African student to ever enter into university, and she entered into university at the age of 14. And her name is Maud Chifamba. Welcome, Maud. Thank you. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm fine. Please reintroduce yourself. Okay. I am a 19 year old mm -hmm. girl. I am a Bachelor of Accountants Honors degree graduate from the University of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, I would describe myself as a lovely character. Definitely. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Okay, so was it a conscious decision that you made to go to university at the age of 14? No, mm -hmm. and yes. Okay. Um, so when I was in primary school, mm -hmm. um, I never really had a goal to say I want to go to university when mm -hmm. I was young. Mm -hmm. But um, I skipped when I was in primary because it, the whole journey started through a mistake. Okay. My teacher, mm -hmm. we were learning in composite classes, we're going three, four, and five, four, and one class, okay. but they basically learned different things. Okay. So when I was in grade three, mm -hmm. I was given a paper for grade four. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it was a math paper, and I'm very good with numbers. I see. So I totalized the grade four paper when I was in grade three. Mm -hmm. So the following time, I said, can I please write a paper for grade five? Because okay. I was in grade three. Okay. So the teacher said, okay, it's fine, you can write. So I wrote a grade five paper. And then the following year, there was a lot of confusion, like, is she going to grade four or is she going to grade six? Okay. And the teacher was saying, oh, school is not all about knowing things. It's also about you growing up. Yes. So yes. you're supposed to stay in grade four. Okay. And I remember I made a scene. I took it out. <laughs> I, I made a scene basically at school okay. until they let me go to grade six. Okay. So basically I did grade three, four, and five in mm -hmm. one year. Mm -hmm. And then grade six and grade seven. And then when I went to secondary school, I had no money for going to the conventional schools because the place I stayed in there was no high school, it was okay. in the resettlement areas. Okay. So I had no choice but to eat at home. Mm -hmm. So basically I was homeschooled. Okay. And uh, I was reading at home. And then after form five after form four, mm -hmm. I then got a sponsor for form five and then form six. That's when it actually hit me like, oh, so I'm actually going to go to university mm -hmm. when I'm young and it's going to be good for me because yes. I'm going to also get 
a sponsorship, a mm -hmm. lot of scholarship mm -hmm. and also because I now have the edge factor to my yes. uh, advantage. So basically it wasn't like someone thought about it to say we're going to do it this mm -hmm. way, but mm -hmm. it just kind of fell into, into place. place. Okay. Yeah. Now I know that you've had a tough childhood. Yeah, yeah. Losing both your parents was mm -hmm. definitely, you know, one of the most traumatic experiences. It is. What kept you going? Okay, so my family, uh, the school was, we were a poor family. Okay. Um, we were originally from Gokwe. Okay. And uh, in the, you know, in those areas, you had, we, my dad was a soldier and okay. we also survived in peace and farming. Okay. Um, but then, you know, if you don't even have cattle, you yes. know that you're poor, or like the poorest in okay. the village. Mm -hmm. And my dad, whether he was employed, he had so many responsibilities. Mm -hmm. My, he had so many wives, so it wasn't the, the pay would not be enough for okay. all of us. It was a lot of children, so we were a poor family. And he would always tell me the only way I was going to to rescue mm -hmm. my family from all this was if I went to school and if I got educated, I got a nice job, I became a pilot, I became a Colonel Rice, yes. and then I would make so much money for the family. <laughs> okay. So even after he went. He passed away I still kept going because I felt this was the only way that mm -hmm. I was going to you know, to redeem my family from mm -hmm. the poverty so basically it was all about the money ah, <laughs> it was all right. about I want to make my family's yes. life yes. better than what it is you are the oldest in from my mom's side I am but I'm not the oldest okay. from my dad's side so obviously you did have that feeling of being taking you know being in that uh, example to you, you know, yes, younger brother. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I really had that feeling of uh, being an example to, you know, my mom, my mom wasn't working and after they passed away, uh, there was really no means for us to live by. Okay. So I had to be that mom to my little yes. brothers as well as also just to use the support that my older brothers were giving me. Now, I know you told me before that you are actually giving back to your community and helping them build your school. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so what happened, the way this idea came to me was, um, before I graduated, I would go around schools talking to my admins, you know, this clear was the age of people in form 3, form 4, yeah, so yeah. I would go around talking to them. But then after I graduated, I had this beautiful, beautiful moment on the with the president mm -hmm. on the, of my graduation day, um, people were just getting kept. But when I got there, when he was told that I was only 18, he he shook my hand wow. and we had a conversation. And the whole crowd, they gave me like a standing ovation. It was very beautiful. And then I thought when I was sleeping after the day, when I was going to bed, I thought to myself, there were a lot of people who could have had that exact moment yes. from where I came from. Mm -hmm. There were people who were bright. Yes. And then they tried to find out what's happening with these people. Mm -hmm. And then there were two people that were very really bright in my, in my primary school. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that one of them, a girl, she already had a kid, and the kid is now in ECB, oh, like five years. Mm -hmm. And she's my age, mm -hmm. so she's only 18. Mm -hmm. And then the guy, he just dropped out of school from grade seven. There was nowhere else for him to go, so mm -hmm. grade seven was it. So I said, why don't I just try to use the platform that I have mm -hmm. to just, you know, to just blow the trumpet on this, like this is what's happening. Yes. So I said, oh, what's the, the easiest thing that I have? I have a lot of followers on Facebook, so yes. let me just put it out there on Facebook. So I just put it out there. This is the school that I went to. They don't even have a decent classroom. Mm -hmm. They use uh, these shares for school, and yes. the kids are sitting on down. They don't have chairs mm -hmm. and tables. And he said, okay, let me just try and do what we can do. It might fail, it might work, mm -hmm. but thankfully God was with us. And uh, we managed to, to start building, we already have the block, although we have not yet roofed it, mm -hmm. but we already have the block. So it was more of just an idea of saying, okay, if it fails, then it fails. Yes. At least I would know that I have tried mm -hmm. to do something for them. So, more. What would you like to say to all the young people who are watching you and they're hearing your story and they're like, wow, if she could do it or if she could make it out of such tough circumstances, uh, you know, I'm also able to do it. What would you like to say to all those young people? <laughs> I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> I have a lot of things to say. Okay, okay. Um, the first thing that I would say, I would, uh, I would tell those 
person why don't you lose that side before like with everyone there is something unique about you yes. find that some um, that thing that mm-hmm. makes you tick so if you see me being an academic and you want to be an academic mm-hmm. it might not work for you yes because if you i always say if you send both parents here try to make him a footballer he wouldn't be as great maybe yes. you wouldn't even know him yes. so find that thing we all have that one thing that god put into us that we'll be very good at and then the next thing that i want to tell is hard work is always rewarded mm-hmm. it's not always uh, we always have to work hard and always when you're working hard there's always going to be friction it's going to be hard yes but what i would say is rest if you have to mm-hmm. but don't quit yes if you have to take a nap just take a nap and then work up be on your grind be on your hustle because at the end of the day it will be a sweeter victory mm-hmm. when you say i had to go through this and this and this for me to get here well thank you so much more for coming through to the show thank you for having me well, thank you so much, obviously, to Dr. Musa for also coming through to the show. Now you can reach us on www.orbit-international.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. See you next time.